Okay, and so welcome everybody to this wonderful event, uh, The Gift of Mentoring or How to Nurture a Poet. Um, this is a celebration of the Joward Compton Poetry Fellowships, which have been an extraordinary program run by Joward Arts, which is the UK's foremost independent funder of artists, curators, and producers in the UK. And the Joywood Compton was based on a bequest by Mr. Compton, Joseph Compton, um, who very generously decided to set up um, a bequest which would help support poets in a way that was quite unusual in that they're given a pot of money and mentoring and development, but unlike other programs, there's no expectation of producing anything at the end. Um, and this is really a very lovely kind of act of faith, um, which is not always the way that things work in the arts world, when very often poets and artists are expected to produce a great deal um, for whatever money they are given. So it's really quite special and an incredible gift, um, an incredibly generous bequest um, that was delivered. So we're now in the third and final round of the fellowships, which I can hardly believe. Um, so tonight is a very special night because we get to celebrate this final round of poets. Uh, we have another event coming up on Friday where all three rounds are represented. But tonight I really want to focus just on these poets. So we have tonight Jiffa Benson, who is sitting over there, Jamie Hale, and the amazing Romelin Ante, who's sitting over here. So we're going to be hearing from all of them. Um, don't worry, I won't be talking for very much longer particularly as I'm not sure the mic is in the right place because they had to move it so low for me. It was like low, low, lower. So anyway, I think we got it right. Um, so first of all, what I'm going to do is introduce the poet. And our first poet who's coming on is Jiffa Benson. Jiffa is a Ghanaian-British multidisciplinary artist. Um, she abridged and adapted the National Youth Theatre's company production of Othello. And she is also a library poetry critic. She is a well-known critic, theater critic for The Telegraph, The Financial Times, and The Times Literary Supplement. She was shortlisted for the inaugural James Berry Poetry Prize. And she was the poet in residence curator at for Whitstable Biennale. Uh, she was also at the BBC Contained Strong Language recently, and she's currently doing a curator in residency at Orleans House Gallery, and is also poet in residence at Pallant House Gallery. Um, she has many, many other strings to her bow, but if I were to tell you all of them, we would be here all night, and she's giggling at me already. So before um, she comes on, we're gonna be hearing from her mentor, and that was one of the things that we wanted to do to celebrate this evening was really to look at this wonderful, magical relationship of mentoring that happens between the poet and the poet that they're working with. So I wanted to actually invite the mentors to come and speak a little bit about the poets that they've been working with, because sometimes it's a bit of a mythical process. Um, and if you haven't been mentored, you may not know exactly what that involves. Um, to be honest, I've been organizing mentoring programs, I think, now for 25 years, although obviously I was only 10 when I started. And um, I recently have had my very first mentor myself for something I'm writing, and it was an eye-opener. It was really not what I was expecting. It was truly quite magical, and it is a gift of somebody seeing your work as it could be and who you can be as an artist. Um, and I really wanted to celebrate that with the audience tonight. Um, so I'm very excited that we also have Jiffa's mentor, Pascal Petit, who is one of the UK's foremost poets. Um, she's published eight collections. Is it eight collections? Um, she has been shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot, the Forwards, so many times. I don't know how many it is, four, five, six, many, many, many times. Um, she won the RSL on Dadje and the Laura Poetry Prize, um, and she is working on a novel. I hope that's not confidential. If it is, everybody knows I can't keep a secret to save my life. Um, oh, gosh, I forgot this was being live streamed. Okay, anyway, I will invite the lovely Pascal to come up and speak to you about how wonderful Jiffa is, and then we will get Jiffa, who will be thoroughly embarrassed by that point, to come up and read. Thank you. Thank you. 
I had to put it lower. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie and John and everyone at Jarewood for the gift of mentoring Jiffa. I also want to say how much I love being part of this family. And I, I was lucky also to mentor for the last co cohort. So I will never forget reading Jiffa's application for the Jarewood Compton Poetry Fellowships. The poems about Sarah Bartman, the Hottentot Venus, which she sent, were so rich and alive, full-bodied, urgent, that it kind of felt as if I was discovering a new Shakespeare. And I know that's hyperbole, but it's needed. But I also thought, why haven't I come across her poetry before? In magazines, for example. But it's there now. Two poems in Poetry Review, just out, and in the More Fire anthology. So Jiffa is well known as um, a poetry critic and a theater critic, playwright, and much more. But I can tell you that she is a very exciting poet. She is Ghanaian British and brings the lively traditions of her heritage into the English canon. She draws on the Anglo Ewe philosophy, which combines four elements sound, rhythm, vibration, and movement into Wu, the art form. And maybe this is what gives her work its trademark energy and aliveness. Her themes are major and urgent, the decolonization of the mind and the empowering of the female black body in European culture, a culture that historically has devalued it. The result is explosive, gripping, original, unforgettable and incredibly alive. I cannot wait for her first collection to come out. And of course, I've seen a preview of it and it's well on its way. So it will be a lucky publisher who gets it. So please welcome Jiffa Afi Benson. Thank you, Pascal. <laughs> that was, if, if I was any fairer, you'd see me blushing. <laughs> and I also want to say thank you to Jerwood. Um, it, it was, I mean, we got, the, we got some money, but it was also the gift of time that that money allowed. Um, soon after... I got the fellowship last year. I went and spent two months in Ghana. And um, I'm going to read three poems today. And those three poems really, um, they're basically what I said I wanted to do in my application. And um, spending that time in Ghana allowed me to, um, you know, set roots down culturally which I hadn't been able to do for a while. And these poems were born out of that time. Um, the first one is called Molding My Drinking Name. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not going to go into the long, complex history of what is a drinking name in the Anglo Ewe tradition. But um, one day I was talking with my mum and her friend, a professor of all things Ewe, and they talked about a drinking name. And I was like, what is this? And it turns out a lot of Ewe surnames came out of drinking names. You'll have to see me later too, so that I can explain the whole thing about drinking name. But as soon as they started talking about it, I decided I wanted one myself. So this is the um, result of that quest. I start 
with what I know. Born in Dame, the month of blossom raining, I am the child who was put outside because family isn't nuclear. My age has been counted in market days and I must not sit on the skin of any animal spotted like a leopard or eat a crab that has been cooked with its legs in the air. Who wants to be that woman who joined a search party looking for herself? Now in Foive, the 13th month of 2021, it's Adame, season of the lowest sun, when dust tinted thick to mustard powder from the doctor wind, fists accra into its long throat. I am the child out in the world so long, Adafie Nu is struck dumb when I claim it's always and forever as my own, the way great grandpa swore to his manhood when he bought that town, said, even if a whale is a humpback, it cannot move Mount Geli, then named himself Sodopo. Loosening your mother's tongue is a boon to the unmaking of your person. If enemies harvest clippings of your hair and fingernails to make their poison, and why did Auntie Vicencia from Togo smear my teeth with laterite soil when she thought I was straying? I must send something back to the gods to outdoor me again, something bright enough to hide the contraction and release of my torso in plain sight as I cross the threshold back and forth seven times, a name that can go ahead of me to announce my imminent arrival. Enye Batawo. I am the child who still wants to live a child from the clan of warlords, priests, soothsayers, and magicians. Suicide cannot be avenged, but fish and chips has not made me forget Akle and Fetridechi. Since one hand cannot catch to the buffalo, the buffalo's horns, or wrestle Sisiblisi the bear, and since uttering its name many times changes the sea, Makokoko the Emapo. I'll put it in, let's see. Ameshika zo azolia blewu la akso fia kuku. The one who walks the long way to the palace will wear the crown, azolia for short. Yes, sounds like a flower. Enyo untonye, it is truly me. It's quite weird doing it in a church because <laughs> It's like I'm getting feedback on my voice. <laughs> so, um, yes, that was my drinking name. As you can see, it's a long story. The one who walks the long way to the palace will wear the crown, which is a comment on how um, long it's taken me to establish myself as a writer. And also, it, it speaks to, I guess, the mythology of the Ewe people. So, given that those drinking names, which is how most Ewe's got their um, surnames after the colonizers came, because before then they didn't have surnames, up to about five generations ago, they had their name, they had their day name, and they had their clan name. And that's how they recognized each other. But so when they started making drinking names, there were stories. They were kind of, you know, sometimes there'll be one word, but really, you know, it's a piece of story. So having found that out, I realized that most Ewe surnames are stories in themselves. So I decided to take a bunch of Ewe names and try and make a poem out of them and see how far I got. So I am going to read out these Ewe names. And um, one of the things I said in my application to Jerwood is, although I understand Ewe very well, it doesn't sit as comfortably in my mouth. So when I say these names, you'll probably hear that tension. Anyway, 
It's called A Nameless Thing is a Vague Thing. It'll probably change. The title will probably change. Abba Jivo. Afolunyenku. Abbeko. Abbema Biasi. Abbeleke. Aboga. Agokonyi. Agbota. Abovi. Agojo. Agbechiama. Ago Mavi, Haji, Ahiabu, Akapo, Akpa Kuvi, Aligeli, Amadaka, Amemonu, Amenuma, Atipo, Avaji, Avujivi, Avugla, Aivo, Azolia, Datsomo, Degodia, the, Demania, Dusa, Drekka, Fiajibo, Fiawu, Gakli, Galivo, Gamo, Gaso, Badama, Baba, Bomita, Jikunu, Gomadu, Kese, Kudolu, Kumasanu, Kumoji, Lagbada, Nkulainu, Nuwogu, Sodopo, Togodo, Tulasi, Vivo, Woyome. And this poem is made up entirely of those names and only those names. Death does wonders and life is frustrating, but it's better that we don't meet because this one must be whispered or the town will hear. Red arse like palm fruit after alcohol and full of hot air, a useless kin who never listened to advice, heard a dog had given birth to a lamb, a sheep's head, a huge sheep, and an ugly child. Gun in hand, like a rat missing its lover, he set off on the stubborn death road of an ambushing snake. At the stump of a tree behind the river, he removed his underwear, swallowed a calabash of goat saliva, then farted his bad beans into farm soil and put the jaw of a dog on top of his penis. Had he not forgotten that the quarrel about a missing cow had not ended and that the nearer in blood, the more bloody the trap? he would not have been such an angry thing on a bicycle made by that blacksmith over there from a bed sheet and scrap metal forged in a corn husk fire on a heap of charcoal. Today is today, but if there is life, tomorrow's a fortunate stumble. Money is different, but just because a whale has a humpback doesn't mean it can ever move Mount Gali. Royalty, as only one person's judgment, is a waste of time and resources. Sorry, God will forgive me for <laughs> saying all those naughty words in church. <laughs> okay, last poem. Um, and I think of this as a, a short story pretending to be a poem, or a poem pretending to be a short story. Um, Twins, like many other cultures, are really revered in Ewe culture, and um, my family has quite a few twins. And I always remembered, as a little girl, they, weren't, they wouldn't use their given names, they would always use the names you always call twins. So this is a little story of Ayi and Echa. Nobody knows when Vina washed her hands in her own birth waters. Not that knowing would have changed anything in that yellow time of Hogwachocho. When she buried the umbilical cord, when she buried the umbilical cords to save for the twins outdooring, a sound like all the whispers that were ever uttered seeped out of her lungs. In her keen and to forebear king, who left footprints in laterite, she heard, they are here to prepare us for what we will be later. At first, it seemed there would be 
It, at first, it seemed they would be a synonym for each other, but Echa, the younger, in a frenzy of warm fury with cupped hands and elbows akimbo, as if she was dancing Agbaja, edged out quick as a fish from between Venus' thighs. It was unsettling how quiet she was, how her eyes immediately focused. A, the elder, fearful of the world and its palavers, but tired of having to carry both their souls like a cipher ancestral, for ancestral habits, felt like her tiny body could eat itself as she blinked her way into life. She could feel the earth holding her close in its bubble of sea sea cooled breeze and wondered what questions her body should now ask. But, she thought, it is always better to be two. They married on the same day. Ayi was widowed early, but not before she was disowned by her husband because of childlessness, and not before he had sent a bottle of the palm nut soup she had made to her family in disgust. Pepper and Ginger are not the same. His voice that day was close to the scalp, a brutal crop. When he died, she would quickly forget what his voice sounded like, as if memory is vegetable and can just rot. Echa was sure a visit marriage with her sister would do right by all of them, but her son's spirit did not want to come near her calabash after that, he received his father's soul in a dream when he stepped on the forbidden stone buried within the buttress roots of a flamboyant tree. Although she tried to cool the road with an offering of beads at the crossing place, the empty space her son, her missing son carved brought the edge of salt to her soul. And the long memory that is in all our blood of the long exodus walking backwards out of the walled city of Noche in Togoland. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. This is where I destroy the mic. Uh, thank you so much, Jiffa, for a wonderful opening uh, tonight. And I would just like to say on the subject of drinking names, if you want to find out what your friends and family really think of you, ask them to come up with a drinking name for you. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. You may be upset with the results, but anyway. Yes, your friends and family may not come up with something that is boastful. Anyway, <laughs> we will carry on with this discussion later. It is actually a really fun thing to do. Um, the next poet is the incredible Jamie Hale. Uh, Jamie is a poet, script and screenwriter, and essayist who is based in London. Their work grapples with the human body as a part of nature. Their pamphlet, Shield, is absolutely extraordinary and is about disability and the COVID-19 pandemic and was published in January 2020. Their solo poetry show, Not Dying, was performed at the Lyric Hammersmith and the Barbican Centre in 2019 and won the Evening Standard Future Theatre Fund Director Theatre Maker of the Year Award. Um, sorry, I've just missed it. Jamie is also the founder of Cryptic Arts, showcasing and developing work by and for deaf and disabled creatives. And he runs a bi-monthly salon for, they run a bi-monthly salon for deaf and disabled writers. And they founded a Disabled Poets Prize, which is at the moment running, and I think Jamie is going to say something about that. Um, I just wanted to say a quick word also before I get Jamie's mentor on, um, which was to say that all three of the poets who were reading tonight, um, they absolutely bowled over the judges during the, the application process and the judging process, and they have absolutely exceeding all of our expectations, um, not just in the poetry that they produced, which was absolutely extraordinary, but also the fact that they're all such innovators 
And Jamie is doing extraordinary things, the Disabled Poetry Prize with Cryptic, with their work that works across performance and, and playwriting, screenwriting. Jif are doing amazing things across the visual arts and poetry, curating, um, and so many other areas. And Romalin, as the founder of Hara Now, which is the first multilingual journal for poetry, which is so absolutely necessary in the UK. Um, so I just wanted to add that to their many bows because they really are quite extraordinary. Also building communities, all three of them. Um, and again, when you're a practicing poet, it's not the easiest thing to be doing. So the fact that they have this generosity of spirit to always be supporting others is really very, very special and is part of the reason why they were chosen and why they're so extraordinary. So Jamie will be coming on in a minute. So they are giving me the eye of like, get on with it. Um, but first, we'll be hearing from their amazing mentor, Fiona Benson, um, published two previous collections. Sorry. Oh, it's Leah and me. Okay, this is, this is me. I'm of an age now where things start to slip and slide. <laughs> okay, so, and this is really embarrassing because I was one of Jamie's mentors. Uh, <laughs> so I've been working with JB for about two years. Um, because I just, as soon as I came across their work, I just thought there is nothing like this, um, which explores these really dark spaces of human existence, of disability, of the human body, in a way that is so universal and so powerful and so beautiful, um, as you will soon be discovering. And what I also soon discovered about Jamie is that as soon as you give them even one task, they will, in five minutes, produce about 100 poems of really, really high quality. Um, it's, it's almost alarming, but quite incredible. So I'm going to read for you a few comments from Leo Boix, who was also his mentor. Leo Boix is an Argentinian-British poet, um, mi hermano, my brother. So he would be not surprised at all that I forgot that we were the mentors. Um, so he, of course, has had wonderful, wonderful things to say about Jamie. And one of the things that we both love about Jamie is their love of Latin American literature, which is quite profound. Um, and it's also a wonderful part of their work, translation. Um, so Leo says, taking on the task to be Jamie's mentor for the Joe Wood Compton Poetry Fellowships was not only an honor, but a great personal joy. Jamie is one of the most hardworking and brilliant poets I have ever known. Working with him through these online sessions has been a delight. Not only did he excel with the writing exercises, but he showed me how flexible, imaginative, and open-minded they are when exploring different forms, tones, and writing avenues. To give you all an idea of Jamie's hardworking spirit, for our first session, I had prepared the usual round of exercises, assuming that I had assembled more than enough material for the two hours we had. Little did I know that Jamie has such energy and assimilates ideas so assuredly and takes up challenges so fast and with such energy that he's, they spontaneously generate more stuff for us to do on the spur of the moment. He put me through my paces rather than me putting me, th me through theirs. I'm sure Jamie will go incredibly far as a poet. Uh, they will go incredibly far as a poet and performer. They are already one of the most exciting new writers in the contemporary poetry landscape in the UK. And I cannot wait to see what comes next. Gracias, Jamie, y que sigan con los éxitos. Well, what an introduction, not least because Fiona was saved from having to introduce me and my work with no preparation. And the Jerwood Fellowships and the mentoring that I've received from Natty, from Leo, and from other poets that, that I've worked with and encountered has been a big part of shaping my work. They talk about how hardworking I am, but the difficult admission is that that's probably the only time that I write because I find it so hard to get started. So the quick fire exercises have been very good at making me actually produce work. And my problem now is narrowing it down a little. That's the next job for Leo and Natalie, I think. Um, choosing what to read tonight, I wanted to bring work that has been shaped by the mentoring process with writers, including but not limited to Natty and Leo. 
So that was the cohering force. And the first piece is in response to a poem that I translated um, for, I think it was the Latin American edition of Magma. Um, the poem was Furias para Danzar by Yoconda Belli. Dancing after fury. I am shed of my fury. Dancing naked against the trees, spastic and fluid at once. I let my rage dwell. Now she emerges, monstrous as the moon, your skin. I have found the hurricane in every lover who's grasped me, violent, gentle, passionate, furious. Each has left me, sun-scarred, salt-cracked, wind-burnt. I have nourished my fury in glacial fires, empty caves and coves. I have buried it, unpicked from tapestries, only to sew it again. I have spun threads, tangled us in them, bare limb to limb, body to body, seen you, my mirror reflection. One day, I will have spent this into dust, dispersed into the hurricane, become one with the skylarks, singing as sirens to welcome you, unwary seafarer. And the next is a poem that has been through many rounds of mentoring and editing to come to where it has done. And apologies to people like Natty for my accent, which remains very English. I left Miss Piernas behind in Spain. Swallow del mar between Miss Pies of Cadiz. That day, el sol scorched me, mi piel blistering and peeling. O quizás, I left them by el hospital abandonado at the end of la ruta del autobus in Córdoba. At night, I was chased by feet. My dreams, the grains of sand, were running, legs mutated into worms, crawled down my throat, choked me at night. My body came alive. They did not come back. No surprise. El regreso is always hard. You can never go home. It has always changed. Or maybe you, Nino, are not the same. You left, a child playing in shoes, my grandes, who thought El Mundo something to learn. Possess, you returned half man half something more alien than that. I'm replacing estas piernas con los arcos de la maquita, great red and white splayed up to support the sky, a stone carved palm from home. I replace them with palabra, lo diente, lo dedo, el espacio. that I may not be quite in the right place with the mic, so I'm just adjusting slightly, which requires quite delicate steering. This one was one of Leo's exercises um, initially. Family tree. Today, I'm asking your body questions, like how many layers of your DNA will it take us to vanish completely? How is it that we have only had a hundred mothers in the last 2,000 years? And look how the world has changed. And could my children even claim to come from the line of miners, of coal and steel, of men, of fire and cracked skin, when my father died before they could be born, and his father before I was born? And I wish I knew how many generations it takes to fade, how many stories does it take?
to be forgotten. And yet, he gave me a piece of coal, a piece of tree compressed into sedimentary rock and mined for us to burn. He brought it home for me to hold, and I have my grandfather's flat cap on the altar to the dead. How far can you look back from your middle-class life and your middle-class house down in the south? And then I hear myself speaking, and the vowels catch me, and I say grass, basket, film, and I say Newcastle, and the things that I inherit are less than memories, just the twist of my tongue in my mouth, and I hear his voice. Another poem that has come from a exercise set by Leo, and actually has had very little editing since that exercise, um, desire after James Baldwin letter from a region in my mind published in the New Yorker 1962 to quote and I began to feel in the boys a curious wary bewildered despair as though they were now settling in for the long hard winter of life I did not know then what it was that I was reacting to. I put it to myself that they were letting themselves go. And I began to feel I had not felt before, not like this, as if a wave had broken inside me and this desire was free to erupt, to force itself onto my posture. The world could see I, urging my face to hide. In the boys, a curious, wary, bewildered despair. There is nothing here for us, only gardens with neat hedges against which I push and pushed, kiss and kissed, touch and touched, until guilt blankets, numbness, fear, despair, as though they were now settling in for the long, hard winter of life. Come away with me. This is not for you. The soaring city calls to me. People like us are real, away from shame. We can give desire its chance, can escape. We become men elsewhere, together. I did not know then what it was that I was reacting to. I have no words for this feeling, except, is it sin? I do not believe that this is a sin, but this is it. The guilty ones build lies on lies like me. I do not wish this lust to shake me, to divide me. I put it to myself that they were letting themselves go. But in the city, choked with the urgent desire, them rubbing themselves against me, wordless, the groping hands at bars, I had a choice, holding back or letting go with love, desire, lust. next piece is from a series exploring the Knights of the Round Table moving through history, which was originally written for bedtime stories at the end of the world and received its input from Mont Zameri. Galahout, Los Angeles, 1985. And there, in the valley of death, in the forsaken Sodom of my people, the curse of our salt-slicked pillars, I learned that all there is is love, alone. And I, the luckiest still alive to have felt this now, drenched, 
soaked in light, him, lance, his striking flesh, his bitter face, his inner warmth. I always knew myself second to none but her. His blazing desire for Guinevere and me, his reckless poison. And I, young, eager, blooming in his love, I blossomed from his fierceness, these great wounds in the richest reds, roses formed of blood and buried deep within my skin. I learned what it is to love my brother, to nurse an endless cough late at night, to gaze at the waiting eyes of my friends and be a stranger. In those yearning moments, my lungs too growing pneumocystis, my endless pills, my bactrim, my desire to be alive, I learned that I had only love and that my brothers were all my people, my loves. If this is it, may some man in the future, holding hands with another like him, like Lance and I, see my grassy grave and say, there went men like us and love, or is the future barren as the present, deep and empty, born with grace and left by death? finish a piece connected with that for a poet called Paul Manette, whose book of sonnets, Love Alone, I bought secondhand on Amazon, only to discover when it arrived on every single page, obituaries of men who had died of AIDS in the same two years, cut, folded, and stuck down. Who was the man who scribed his name into my book in 88, in perfect copper plate, covered it with cut out paper. Where is he now? Why is his book in my hands? Who is the man who pasted death on death until the tome became a tomb and a family album was the same? Who knew the dead, even when the obituary elided AIDS he saw their names and glued them down with love. Still alive in 92, there's my prayer that maybe he slid in this side of the finish. Maybe he caught the drugs in time. Maybe he lived as one of the men who rose like Lazarus when the pills came in. I read the obituaries, all from two years. I wonder if he did this to every book he owned, desperate to keep the dead alive. I am treading in a graveyard, reading a funeral procession, each poem in the book annotated by a man who wanted to remember when to pause, breathe. Did he read them at their funerals? every elegy so distilled in its rage. And now, decades later, I am reading this like a gift, as if somehow I inherit a fragment of someone's story. And for that moment, the dead aren't dead. The men are milling in the forest, murmuring to one another, drifting to motes of dust on yellowed paper, obituaries pasted between the covers of a poetry book. Thank you. Another extraordinary reading, and it really is starting to feel quite fitting that we're in a church because it feels that we've been really blessed by those amazing, amazing poems. Um, I found myself very moved by that. Thank you, Jamie. 
Um, our third and final poet, our extraordinary Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellow, is Romelin Ante. Romelin is a Filipino-British poet, translator, editor, and essayist. She's a co-founding editor, as I mentioned, of Harana Poetry, an online magazine for poets writing in English as a second or parallel language. Her honors are many, and they include the Poetry London Prize, the Manchester Poetry Prize, Society of Authors Foundation Award, Developing Your Creative Practice, uh, Creative Future, and many, many more. Uh, as well as being a writer, she is also a nurse practitioner, and she is, as I recently discovered, also a singer and musician. And no, no, she thought about performing with her guitar and seems to have decided not to. Is that right? Oh, you will be? Okay. Oh. Oh, she's trying. She's very good. But she wants me to say that she's trying. I think she's magnificent. But there we go. So, and I will also introduce her mentor who is Fiona Benson, who is not Jamie's mentor. She is most definitely Romanin's mentor. And I should also say that she's not actually related to Jiffa Benson, which is quite remarkable, but there you go. <laughs> we have the Bensons. Maybe they are related. We will explore this later. Um, she has published two previous collections, which were both shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, Bright Travelers, which also won the 2015 Jeffrey Faber Memorial Prize, and the Seamus Heaney Center for Poetry's Prize for First Fall Collection, and Vertigo and Ghost, which was shortlisted for the 2019 Rathbone's Folio Prize, and won both the Roehampton Poetry Prize and the Forward Prize for the Best Collection. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that Fiona's here as well, because Fiona and Pascal are truly two of my favorite poets. So we've been very, very, very blessed to have them as the mentors. Um, I wanted to add my thanks to Pascal's, to Natalie and Jeremy for um, including me in the Jerwood Compton family. It's been an enormous privilege to hear the phenomenal readings tonight and to join you. It's also my great honor to introduce Romelin Ante to you this evening. In many ways, she needs no introduction. Her luminous debut, Antiemetic for Homesickness, has earned her justified acclaim, and I was certainly already a fan. <laughs> I was honored and thrilled to be asked to mentor her. But to be honest, I've probably learned more from Romelin than she has from me. As another of the poets I most greatly admire, Tracy K. Smith has commented, Romelin Ante writes a poetry of rapturous images and riveting conscience. Ante is indeed a visionary image maker Images bloom in her work with unusual intensity and beauty. Ante is also a poet of incredible empathy, a powerful heart, Sean Hewitt calls her, attuned in the very fiber of her being to the sufferings and joys of others. She brings to her poems several areas of hard-won expertise and specialist knowledge. She writes of her birth country, the Philippines, its terrains, flora, fauna, history, trauma, mythology, and folklore. She writes of her adopted country with a preternatural clarity and grace. She writes towards the migrant population from the Philippines that lives and works and is often exploited here. And I can't read my own writing, oh yeah, of nursing, <laughs> um, both its intimate vocabulary, vocabulary of the body and the traumas of the mind that distress the young people Ante cares for. She writes of her own experiences as a human moving through the world, her own loves and heartbreaks, her body's triumphs and its fragilities. And Roma is, in a very serious way, a linguist, fascinated by the dual meanings Tagalog words can carry, how they are a door that can open more than one way, 
and obsessed with the intricacies of the English language and how far she can push it and what she can make it do. She has a suppleness of syntax and richness of vocabulary that most of us can only envy and a scope that we can only dream of. As you will have gathered, Romelin Ante is a poet of great richness, complexity and reach. When mentoring her, it has seemed to me that every idea that comes out of her mouth is a poem. <laughs> and I have found her endlessly inspiring and inspired. My most repeated advice to Roma has been to step into her power, something we all need to hear sometimes. Um, in Roma's case, this power is profound and immense. She is one of the great poets and souls of our time, writing talismanic poems to hold against the dark. I give you Romelin Ante. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm just going to grab a chair quickly. <laughs> and also grab my guitar <laughs> quickly. I'm not really a musician, but um, one of my goals uh, for being a Jerwood Compton Fellow is to try to mix language with music. Because where I came from, we have a lot of folk Filipino poetry, which is in a form of songs. The musician in my family is my father, really. And sometimes he would turn around to his mates and say, how come my children didn't get my nice voice, <laughs> so I'm trying to, to um, uh, claim from the universe that I could be a musician as well. The first poem that I'm going to read is called Agimat, which translates as amulet. Many of you know that I came from a nursing background, but my father's side are all shamans and agimat bearers. My dad actually, every time, I was scared as a child, he would whisper incantations to me, and somehow I would feel invincible. And I felt like I could charm anyone at classroom, even my enemies. I could tame the rabid dog next door. But throughout the years of being a nurse, especially in the last couple of years during the pandemic, um, I moved from the physical health nursing field to the mental health. And I've been working with many children and young people who have suffered, but also who have showed improvement and proved their own resilience. But sometimes when I'm so tired, I feel that I wish that I could pass my agimat onto them. And sometimes even my own agimat, I, I don't even believe in it. And I guess this poem is my attempt to explore those emotions. There is a section in this poem that has to be sung. Um, it is in Tagalog words, and it is in Tanaga form. So Tanaga is a Filipino poetic form that poses a question and poses your wishes. Agimat. A child bears many faces, but mine was etched only by the panic of dusk. So my father chanted, transplanting a spell to my blood. Agimat ko, hiningang buga sa aking noo. Soon, I stopped recoiling from the bark of the next door Doberman. I whistled strolling past metacarpal twigs that scraped into Capri's hands. Father sang, Lahat my agimat, 
everyone has a gimat. It is passed down to every child. This charms the buried light of stars. This deflects bullets. And this unblooms a war. But I've forgotten all the trees of our town. How once astride a branch, I coaxed God to come down with ginger lilies steeped in a gimat plucked from the jutting rib of a precipice. Now, my clinic's walls throb, mud in the rain. In this swivel chair, I gasp, but I can't drown. Every time a child knocks, nurse, I cut myself again. He rolls up his sleeve, dried herringbone of scars. In the season of arachnids, a year nine leap off a cliff, believing her shadow drag the red granite wind. Nurse, in my hometown, sunrise blasts like gunpowder. Twilight sizzles with fragments of flesh. I lay dry dates onto my father's plate, filled oil jars with copper coins I earned from brushing factory rugs. His only agimat, gold motes rising to his face. Nurse, I took a peek. Father furs into a wild boar. Meth bright tusk stabs mother at her cheek. Ang mga batang ito tinakin ng anino agiman tagong dulo paano mata. Nurse, last night, a mound of laundry swelled into a wreckage. My brother's hand poked out, asterisk with black powder and blood. There is a place where grazed knees and elbow wounds become bearable, where a child crawls out of the bruises of a field into a dusk so lustrous, heaven marinates itself. I will rehearse the Agimat bearer's chant until a child can sleep in its lullaby of unearthed skulls, a spine glowing like a tower in a rain-swept town. May this clinic tremor into a cave with vines that swallow the door beams, a burl that encrusts the knob I will chant until every wound curls into a bud and no child knocks. Nurse, I cut myself again and the girl will only leap unbreakable into the whirlwind. The next poem and the last poem that I'm going to read is called, Why Is It Dark at Night? And it's really inspired by the many questions that we ourselves ask when we're children and also the many wonderful and weird questions that children normally ask. 
Again, this poem is written in the poetic form. Uh, I should know, <laughs> but I forget. Taling Dao. Taling Dao. So, Taling Dao, there's a refrain in this poem. And this refrain is normally sung by everyone in the room. And it is sung in, the respon in a responsory manner. There's only two lines, so, and they're in English. So they are, why are you out on this dark night? Come back home out of wild beast sight. As if we're telling the child to come home away from the dangers of the night. Are you ready to sing it with me? No, I, I won't put you on the spot. My, my dad said, don't put your audience on the spot. Sing it alone. Um, by the way, I want to, to thank my dad because my dad is really the one who's putting the uh, arrangements on my poems. And if he's here, uh, he would do all this nice plucking, but I can't do it, so I'm just going to strum it. Taling Dao is also a form in which each stanza is, is spoken by a different person. But for this evening, I will just say which person is speaking, just for clarity. This is also a part of my Mebuyan series in the new work that I am working on with the help of the wonderful Fiona Benson. So Mebuyan is a mythical creature in the Philippines. She is actually a goddess from the heaven, but she chose to travel to the underworld to help and feed the souls of the dead children. And in this poem, Mebuyan is the narrator. Thank you for listening. And again, it's been a privilege reading with such incredible fellow fellows, Jenny and Zifa. Why is it dark at night? The scientist claims there are more stars than grains of sand, but they fall away as the universe expands, so we'll never reach their light. The grandmother says, there was once a poet who fell in love with a samurai, but his katana conjured a hundred lightning storms. So she had to spill her ink across the scroll of the sky. Why are you out on this dark night? Come back home. Out of wild beside the village drunk sings all I love have left I battered the heaven with an empty bottle until it's covered in iridescent bruises the village priest confesses all who left I've learned to love my prayers flicker into blue-black moths, petaling around God's mouth. Why are you out on this dark night? Come back home out of wild beast sight. The food vendor on the side street shoes away a street kid with a rattan rod top with a red plastic mop she uses to shoo away flies she churns a broth of ox bone and says this is the tastiest in town when the crickets rush into a chorus this broth congeals into a moon so luminous the queen of cosmos shuts her eyes why are you out on this dark night? Come back home out of wild beast sight. Meanwhile, the child shooed away by the vendor, accused of stealing by the priest, and punched in the eye by her drunk father, walks out of an alleyway. Her silhouette between buildings 
a semicolon. She strolls the village alone, not finding out the truth, which is that the gods and the kings, in tales and histories, all afraid of a child. So they concocted a plan to smudge the world with the grit of their palms. Why are you out on this dark night? Come back home out of wild beast sight. Why are you out on this dark night? Come back home out of wild beast sight. But no one calls the child home. She hears nothing but the slantwise sheen of scars on her arm she's forgotten she's had. The sky sinking darker now. All pulverized glass of stars falling further from her reach. The wind flinches at the blades of leaves. In other versions, the child grows up to tell this story. Thank you. using two microphones. Um, so if I could invite the poets and the mentors up towards, it's not exactly the stage, is it? The kind of pulpit area. Um, we're going to have just chat a little bit about mentoring. Uh, Fiona's looking very, very alarmed. <laughs> no, no, I have that face all the time. So if everybody could come up, reluctantly. <laughs> Um, and as we're a fairly small and intimate group, I'm hoping to get some audience involvement as well, um, which will not involve singing. Okay. <laughs> you can see that we spent hours practicing this. Oh, I have got a chair. Okay. Right, so I really, really loved hearing the mentors' um, descriptions of their poets. And I think from now on, all poets should be introduced by mentors or people who've worked with them um, because it was just so generous and beautiful and it really said so much about their work but also the work of the mentor themselves. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask, and this is for the Gerard Compton Fellows, is what was the highlight of your mentoring journey and was there anything that surprised you about it? Um, does anybody want to volunteer or I'll start picking on people? Jamie, <laughs> Jamie said, don't, don't, don't ask me, don't ask me. Thanks for that, Natalie. Um, I think for me, the highlight was the sense in my work, and this is true both of the mentoring I received from Natty and Leo, that somebody believed in the possible output and that set a very high expectation for me because if it was something that someone believed in, it had to be good and I had to do it well. And that definitely motivated me to actually do the writing rather than thinking about writing and talking about writing and avoiding writing. Out of a desire, I suppose, to demonstrate and to return to recognize the gift of time and effort and to return that with commitment and energy and growth. And so I think really for me, the highlight was just that synergistic process of, particularly with Leo being set endless exercises and expected to produce the impossible, doing my best to do so anyway. Him saying, that's great, here's another exercise, which was frankly brilliant. 
Yes, I can say from the other end, Leo would always call me after your sessions and say, I gave, I gave Jamie the exercises and they did them so brilliantly. I had to come up with more exercises and then more exercises. What am I going to do? I've run out of exercises. <laughs> so it's quite funny hearing it from your end, but that sounds great. Was there anything about it that surprised you that you weren't expecting? I mostly write sonnets and Leo asked me to write things other than sonnets and then I wrote things other than sonnets and quite liked them and realised there were things to write other than sonnets. That is, of course, slightly, slight hyperbole, but that expectation to produce work in forms and shapes and from prompts that didn't feel natural and felt like I was really wrestling with it. But actually, quite a few of the pieces I read this evening came from that, that expectation and... I really grew as a result of it when I thought that I would just sit there and stare at the screen blankly and say, it's not a sonnet though, Leo. Yeah, I think that's one of the roles of the mentor is really to see something that maybe the poet themselves hasn't seen yet, but is, is definitely able to see. Um, and I remember the first time I met you, Jamie, that I realized immediately, oh my goodness, this poet has such a Latin sensibility. Um, of course, I do say that to a lot of poets because I'm like, everybody, you're Latin. Is that Latino? Vas a escribir algo? You know, they're always like, oh God, not again. Um, but with you, it really did come to pass and has been quite extraordinary. So that's been quite a gift. Okay, so we have two more victims who are sitting there very quietly. Jiffa was like, please don't ask me. So, Jiffa. Natalie. <laughs> yes. The, the highlight of your mentoring journey, and was there anything that surprised you? Um, to be honest, I think it's been one big highlight. Um, I still, I'm still chewing on the fact that I get to have a poet of Pascal's caliber looking at my poems and being really enthusiastic and complimentary about my ability, so I'm still riding on that. Um, I guess what surprised me is part of the same thing, um, how much enthusiasm Pascal has had for my poetry and also um, how much confidence um, the process has helped me, to, to instill in me. So, yeah. That's I'm, all. <laughs> I'm curious, did Pascal, did you ask um, Jiffa to write anything that perhaps she hadn't thought about writing before? I'm just curious. I, I, I don't know if I did actually, because it's a little while since we last met. Um, to be honest, the, the manuscript that Jiffa sent me it was just so rich. So the work was there. I, I didn't actually feel that I, I needed to bring out more. I thought it was more um, encouraging it and wanting to, to edit it and shape it more. Um, so it was more of a shaping process than anything else. And yeah, it was just a actually really astonishing work. I just had no idea that it existed, you know. I never get tired of hearing Pascal say that. <laughs> Sorry. Pascal, thank you. Thanks. So, Roma, are you happy to say something? Um, I think I am very similar with uh, Tifa. Um, I still couldn't believe that Fiona Benson Fiona Benson <laughs> is mentoring me. Um, I really love her, all her books. And I think it's been a gift for me because I feel that I get to really be serious on my craft, on really crafting, you know, before they, say, they tell you, oh, when you edit your poem, you know, do this, do that. But with Fiona, I feel like I'm a real, um, I have become a more, um, I guess, are an artist, that there's really something to craft. So I really like um, the way she scrutinized even each word, um, the, the rhythm of my, my poems. But also one of 
the highlights as well is the fact that I am encouraged by Jerwood um, to, to step out of my comfort zone, you know, to just experiment, do whatever it is that I want to do. So, for example, incorporating music in more Tagalog poetic forms. Um, I've always had um, second thoughts about that, but I think th that that's what being an artist is really, just expanding our horizons. And Fiona, was there anything about the mentoring journey that surprised you? I know you do a lot of other mentoring, but with, with Romelin, was there anything in particular? That's um, well, Romelin, I mean, Romelin is an amazing writer. She doesn't really need me at all, but I think um, there was a gap that you wanted a reader, and I think um, that's what I could be for Roma. And uh, also, Roma's incredible. I mean, I think she's a genius, and... I think what I provide is a slightly stupid reader, actually, which is just asking Roma sometimes to slow down in her leaps. Um, yeah, but it's, it's been revelatory, really, and just such a privilege to work as, as a reader for Roma because there's so much depth to her work and um, it has such reach and ambition and just being able to spend time with that you know with Roma's work I receive it and then I read it and then I come back to it and then I come back to it again I have to keep coming back to it because there's so many layers to it and um, yeah I'm very happy to be her slightly plodding reader <laughs> I'm sure you're not plodding but I think that really brings out something about the mentoring relationship which is how much the mentors get out of the process as well because I think especially people who haven't been mentored sometimes think oh it's a very hierarchical process um, you know and the mentor will pass down wisdom and the mentee will take it in and it really isn't like that at all it's much more about two equals who are maybe at slightly different points in their careers or the journey who have different things to impart and share um, and I loved the way Fiona said that she told Roma to step into her power because I think that's a huge, huge part of the mentoring um, and a really, really beautiful part of it as well. And I must say with Jamie, the only thing that really ever surprised me about mentoring Jamie was, actually there were many things, the, the, amount, the amount of poetry that came out was, was slightly amazing. Um, but also the main thing that really continues to surprise me to this day is how unaware they are of the brilliance of their work um, and I think that's true of all the all the Jerwood Compton fellows, and it really struck you know it struck me again listening to them tonight. They're so accomplished, they're so brilliant and extraordinary, and the fact that they don't seem to quite you know have they still have humility and that integrity as well, which I think is just really beautiful. Um, so you know, thank you also to the mentors for the amazing work that you've done. Um, so I thought as we have got quite a small group, we could possibly reach out to the audience if anybody wants to ask something. Do we have any questions in the audience? Otherwise I will carry on. It, yes, Kaya, do you have a question or are you just gonna say something about the mic? Oh, okay, great. I, I hope they're not all for me. <laughs> Um, so we've got from Kath Drake, it would be great to hear more about the approach to mentoring. How do they encourage work that hasn't shown its potential yet? Um, and also keen to hear about the approach in working with a beginner writer not used to feedback, if that is relevant. I don't know why everybody's looking at me. Um, the beginner writer, I mean, as, as you can tell, none of these writers were anywhere near beginner writers, so I don't think it applies. Um, as a general rule, beginner writers don't tend to enter into a very intense mentoring relationship because it does require this kind of slightly more equal basis. Um, and I think that it just wouldn't be quite suited um, as far as, as I could tell. I've never had mentored somebody or been mentored by somebody, um, so I couldn't really speak to that. Um, what was the other question? Kaya, it's run off again. 
the approach to mentoring. Um, I will pass it on to you two in a second. I guess my approach to mentoring, um, I kind of foisted myself on Jamie, to be honest. <laughs> I sort of just showed up and said, I think you're extraordinary, um, and I would really like to see if I can work with you. Um, so my approach to mentoring is really to go towards people who I know there is something that I can bring out in them. Um, which is not to say that there aren't other people who are absolutely brilliant, it's just perhaps I don't have the skill set to support them or develop them in a way that I think is meaningful to them. So I hope that's my approach. Jamie's looking like, no, oh, you were a crazy lady and you told me exactly what to do. Um, actually, I'd be really interested to hear, what was my approach to mentoring? As I recall, it was to show up in my hospital room <laughs> with about 12 books and a huge amount of homework. <laughs> and boy, was I relieved because I was so bored. Yeah. And I think it's really just been an, an approach of being like, that was great, try something new. That was great, try something else new. And for me, that kind of creative part of the mentoring process has been really helpful. So I think it seemed as a mentor that what you did was stretch me in as many directions as possible and then see what worked. Yes. Well, I saw that as you're in hospital, I had a captive audience and <laughs> you couldn't go anywhere, which is, as a mentor, it's a gift. <laughs> Um, but no, it was, it was amazing because one of the things I immediately spotted in Jamie's work was this potential to try so many different things. Um, and I was just like, oh, well, they can do that and they can do that. So I'm sure they could do that as well. So that's been an absolute joy. Um, I think it's been a joy. <laughs> Jamie and I will have a chat about this later. Um, an absolute joy. A joy, yes, you have to say that. So Pascal? Uh, yeah, um, I've mentored quite a, a lot of people, and um, ev everyone, of course, has a different journey. And I think with each one, it's a learning process for me. Um, I usually send a, a manuscript or a sheath of poems, and I, I read these over a period of time and try to... Um, <clears throat> try to absorb this new world, you know, that, that this person is bringing, bringing forth into our world. And I try to, you know, for example, with, with Jiffa, there's um, the airway culture. And so I do some research because <laughs> this is a new thing for me. And so... Um, so I really try to, to have a, a deep reading of the person's work. And then to, I actually go through every single poem, line, word by word, line by line. And we work out um, how could this be better? How could this be improved? And so we both rack our brains to, to kind of work around that. And so it's, it's very much a collaborative and learning um, uh, structure, really, to, to the mentoring. And um, yeah, our first session, actually, was about four hours long, wasn't it? Because <laughs> we just, you know, there was these amazing poems, and I, and I look, read them and thought, yeah, how can we make these um, really, like, absolutely fantastic so that no one can resist them. And so that, that was my task and Jiffa's task. And uh, it's, it's really exciting. It's a really exciting process, and I recommend it to anyone. Um, uh, and it helps you with your own writing. It helps me with my writing. It expands my language and my image making and everything. I think I just want to say something to that in terms of, um, I think part of it is having a dialogue. And you know, um, poets as writers tend to work alone, unlike you know, other kinds of art forms. So one of the great things about having a mentor is having a dialogue about your work. 
because I find that when you are talking to somebody and exchanging ideas, it opens up new pathways that you didn't think of. I can think of a couple of ex examples. Um, um, Fiona showed me, I haven't seen it yet, but in the latest um, issue of Poetry Review, I have two poems which Pascal pushed me, she's been pushing me to send my poems out because generally I've had poems published if somebody's asked me to be in an anthology, but um, on <laughs> Pascal's insistence, I now have um, two poems in Poetry Review and one of the those poems is a block that has no punctuation in it. And the last line is in the benevolence of British civilization. And when Pascal looked at it, she said, oh, that's the last line. So bring it down so that that last line sits proud. And on another occasion, I have a poem called Six Scientists in Search of an Ology. And Pascal said, well, it's six, so it's wanting to be six. Maybe that's six um, verses. And then I thought, oh, Sestina, you know, <laughs> which is a poem that is, of, yeah, Sestina is six verses, isn't it? This is, so, so I thought, oh, six scientists, six, six verses, a Sestina. So, you know, I, I don't know if I would have arrived at those conclusions myself, so, you know, that's what um, part of the mentorship is, is that dialogue you have that then enriches how you see and perceive things, not only your own work, but also the nature of poetry itself. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed hearing the mentors emphasizing so much about the reading part of it. Um, and it's been very, very obvious from what they've said that a really good mentor, like a really good editor, meets the poet or artist where they are rather than trying to impose something. And I think that's such an important part of the journey um, for all of us. Kaya, is there time for another question? There's a good one here, which says, how do you encourage someone to step into their power? <laughs> You're giving that to me. <laughs> um, I, think, I think confidence is a major problem for writers, actually. I think we're often alone in our room with a poem. <laughs> and we start telling ourselves we can't do it or write it or that all our work is rubbish. <laughs> and we all do that, I think. Um, so how do you get somebody to step into their power? Well, I think um, encouragement is one of the key forces in, in art. Like if, if nobody is listening to you and telling you that they want to hear you, um, that it's very hard to keep that belief in yourself sustained. So I think, I hope that one of the things I've done for Roma is to tell her how amazing she is and how, you know, how complex and how, how I'm there to hear her poems and to hear all the bits that maybe she thinks are boring and she should skip over. No, I want that, you know, I want it all. I want all of what she does. Um, Mark Doty has that lovely thing about we are, we are, human beings and we are of interest to each other are we not and uh, yes we are and um, yeah I'm really I'm just really pleased to have heard these powerful voices today Pascal did you Yeah, um, I, I would totally echo that, that um, a, a good deal of the work is about empowering and um, give, um, giving confidence which ought to be there but, it, but isn't. And, um, and actually you're also saying, actually what you're doing is really important and valuable and wow, and very exciting. And that, that's how I felt about Jiffa's work. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure that she realizes just how exciting it is. 
and you know, and that's why it needs to to go be out there in the magazines, the anthologies, and soon in a book, you know, because it, it is something new. Yeah, I think for me, being a mentor or developing artist is really being a sort of benevolent mirror, um, but an insightful one, hopefully, based in fact. Um, but you show them the best possible version of themselves as an artist because you have that gift of being able to see it. So you give that gift to them and then they can step into their power. And it's a huge part of mentoring. You know, it's very, very intense because it's that one-on-one. -on -one. But I think that's at the heart of working with artists in general um, is you learn to have that eye. So you will find the artists in front of you who may not even know that they're artists. Um, and then the mentoring is kind of the more concentrated version of that. So you're holding that mirror very, very close to them and saying, no, this is who you could be, not just now, but this is who you could be in five years' time and 10 years' time. And again, that's allowing them to step into their own power because they start thinking of themselves as artists in the long term and poets in the long term having a career rather than just, this is who I am right now. And it's that moment of kind of real excitement when they get it, yes, this is my whole life, and someone is validating that, and it's really, really quite powerful and emotional. I think there's also just something small on this and the previous question about beginner writers and about it not necessarily needing to be that degree of intensity of mentoring. A lot of the work that I do now that revolves around Paul Manette's work, I remember many, many, many years ago, Jif are putting a huge amount of time and effort into editing my first attempt at any kind of academic engagement with his work. And I don't think that ever came to anything as a piece. But what it did do in that period of time that the work was being edited was show me that somebody believed in me enough to invest their own time into trying to help me do better and get it and improve something. And I think sometimes mentoring a beginner writer isn't necessarily about building that long-term relationship. It's about giving that, that real gift of time and effort at a point where it can do a lot to shape somebody. And so I just think maybe that that's a part of mentoring we don't see as much, is also just the impact that that can have on somebody many years down the line and that it can really stick with someone who encouraged them at a point when they needed it. Yeah, I think that's, that's a beautiful point to make. Kaya, do we have just we, one more question? Oh. Thank you. Um, what do the poets feel they still need for their development at this point? They're probably going to say time and money, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's. <laughs> that's um, I think it's it's very hard to answer that question. What I've learned, though, from especially from this mentoring process, is allow yourself to take your time. So, do not give up. Push your work. Um, scrutinize your ideas. Become your own reflective practitioner. Because I think that's what I've realized from from Fiona as well. It's not just like many of us has, are saying, it's more of collaborative work and discussion, but also um, she's taught me as well to become my own reflective practitioner, what I'm gonna do with this poem, what am I gonna do with the ideas that she's given to me? So I think that's, that's quite a difficult question <laughs> to, 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 to answer. My, my focus is really just focus on my work now and see where this development could take me, then perhaps I can answer that question better. I think my answer is going to be very pragmatic. I just need to get the poetry out there and get a book out there because um, I think I haven't had access to certain things because I don't have a book. Um, like, for instance, um, um, a festival organizer said, oh, as soon as your book's ready, I will um, put you on the program. And I don't, I don't get 
a lot of those kind of um, requests. And I know it's because I haven't got a book. So it's, it's a very practical part of developing, I think, because I haven't had those experiences before. So I don't know. Mind you, I've had other experiences. Poets haven't had, so <laughs> that's okay too. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to seem like poor me, but yeah, a book out there and the poems in magazines as Pascal. <laughs> That's just me to do. I think I would say probably actually pressure and expectation that it can be really difficult to keep committing time and effort to the uncertainty of poetic crafting on your own when you don't know what you're going to do with it. You don't really know if it's any good and it's very easy to fall into that sort of, this paperwork is, is more important and I could just do the paperwork and to find it difficult to really remember what Natty once said to me about doing the work that only I could do, not the work that somebody else could do. And so I think for me, it's, it's having that pressure and expectation to keep writing, to keep editing, also to get my work out there, which is something I am not very good at, at, at doing. I, 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 don't, I don't like doing it, um, it is difficult. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's that, and it's something that we need more of a community of in poetry, is that kind of, the cheerleading, the support, the kind of informal reading and working through of each other's work, the spaces to do that, but also the kind of expectation that comes with, you are a brilliant poet, but you're not a brilliant poet if you're not reading or writing or doing anything related to poetry because you need, you need to do that, which is what the reminder I, I think I most need most often. And I have a feeling that having said that, I will never be able to escape, Natalie. I was just going to say I have great good news for you. Perfect. Le Leo and I will be mentoring you forever. <laughs> <laughs> what more could one want? Exactly. So on that wonderful note, um, I think we're going to wrap things up for this evening. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Thank you so much. I know it is extremely wet and cold and we've suddenly gone into winter. Um, I also wanted to thank the Poetry School, which is the UK's foremost provider of poetry education, um, which put together this event in partnership with us and are responsible for this absolutely stunning venue, um, which is really very, very beautiful even if it does echo a lot, which is slightly alarming. Um, and I would also like to invite you guys, we have one more event on Friday, which is the final celebration for the Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellowships. And there will be poets from all three rounds. So Jane Kamain, the wonderful editor of Nine Arches Press and poet um, from the first round, we will have Anthony Joseph, whose current collection, Sonnets for Albert, is up for the Forward Prize. Um, Yomi Shode, whose new collection, Mannerism from Penguin, will be coming out on October 6th um, from the second round. And then we will have these magnificent poets, so you will have another opportunity to hear from them. And you will also hear from me, but hopefully not too much. So I very much hope to welcome you all back at 6.30 on Friday. And thank you to all the mentors and the poets for an amazing, amazing evening. Thank you. Thank you.